Good evening and welcome to this, the seventh episode of KBTV, the virtual Kennington Bioscope, streaming live from London via YouTube. Tonight's show will run a little bit differently, as I'm sure, if you're regular viewers, you've become accustomed to, to, to the format of our online programmes, consisting mostly of a selection of shorter films. But for this evening's streaming, we're running what is so far only our second feature film. And because of the slightly longer running time and derivation of this film, we thought it should proudly stand alone. For we are most pleased to present, for the first time on KBTV, a British silent film preserved in the National Archive from our very own BFI, the British Film Institute. And we want to thank them very much for their generosity and cooperation in joining with us towards our online endeavours. The feature you'll be seeing tonight, which has been available to view for free on the indispensable BFI player for the last three years, but sans music, is the first screen version of Harold Brighouse's 1916 play, Hobson's Choice, produced by the Master Films Company in 1920. Lancashire-born Brighouse was a prominent member of the Manchester School of Dramatists. Declared unfit for combat for the First World War, he joined what would later become the Royal Air Force, and on finding himself seconded to the Air Ministry Intelligence staff, it was during this period he also found the time to write Hobson's Choice. The play was first staged, somewhat surprisingly, in New York, due to the involvement of Ben Iden Payne, a theatrical innovator and colleague of Brighouse, raised in Manchester. The play then transferring to London later in 1916, to the Apollo Theatre, where it ran for 246 performances before moving to the Prince of Wales Theatre. One of the London cast members, Joe Nightingale, reprised his role for this screen version as the gauche boot bootmaker, Will Jessup. The story concerns a 19th century Salford businessman, Henry Horatio Hobson, played here by Arthur Pitt, portraying the tyrannical bootmaker and widower who appears latterly to be married to the Masons and the Moonrakers, his local inn. With his serious penchant for the pub, and with three grown daughters still at home, monitoring his movements and answering him back, 
he gets the feeling that the women are somehow gaining the upper hand on him and announces that his two younger, prettier daughters should be swiftly married off. But the elder of the three, the plainer and more pragmatic Maggie, pronounced an old maid by her pa, finds the impetus needed when paternal push comes to patriarchal shove and decides to take matters into her own hands and sets her bonnet at the shop's best bootmaker, the gauche Will Jessup. And she determines that if the bootmaker fits, she'd be better off putting her best foot forward with him by her side. Maggie is played expertly by Joan Ritz, who I feel perfectly conveys the spirit of the woman and from whom we gain a real sense of Northern character and atmosphere. She is clearly at ease here, and that may be partly due to the partnership with her husband, Percy Nash, the director of Hobson's Choice, who also helmed all but two of the 18 films she made between 1914 and 1921. Nash made mostly journeyman-like pictures until the year following this, when he turned cinematic conspiracy theorist with How Kitchener Was Betrayed, which exploited rumours around the death of Lord Kitchener and was banned by the authorities on its release. Retired from features thereafter, Percy Nash concluded his celluloid career a few years later with a safe series of documentary shorts. Of course, further film versions of Hobson's Choice followed soon after the talkies came in, firstly in 1931, with the most famous version being that from 1953, directed by David Lean, featuring an exceedingly starry British cast, certainly as regards the male leads at least, with Charles Lawton as Hobson and John Mills playing Willie Mossop. And I'll also make mention of a 1983 made-for-TV version by CBS in the US, which relocated the setting to New Orleans and featured silent film royalty amongst its cast in the form of one Miss Lillian Gish. Nearly every decade, it seems, has seen another, if not several, versions of the play produced in some fashion. The story was even adapted into a ballet in the late 80s, choreographed by David Bintley, performed by the Sadler's Wells Company at Covent Garden, and resurrected again in the last couple of years by the same company, now renamed as the Birmingham Royal Ballet. And it was even turned into a Broadway musical. For the 100th anniversary of the play in 2016, it was revived at London's Vaudeville Theatre with Martin Shaw playing Hobson. Harold Brickhouse himself was president of the Lancaster Footlights Club in the 1920s, so it's also entirely fitting that the Footlights staged the play at their Lancaster Grand Theatre in recent years, and we're certainly glad to be marking the film's centenary here. 1920 itself marked somewhat of a great leap forwards in burgeoning cinematic terms. With the turmoil of the Great War now one or two years behind them, the privations also experienced by the creative industries could be somewhat surmounted. A more modern age was anticipated and artistic ambition and achievements in the medium then marking its silver anniversary in 1920 meant that the silver screen saw an explosion of ideas and innovation. The BFI's own Bryony Dixon wrote an article on the compelling nature of the international film product of 1920 for May's issue of Sight and Sound. And I myself, since March's lockdown began, have been voraciously scouring the contemporary trade magazines gripped by the films released in 1920 and the surrounding industry news articles. And on Twitter, via my own hashtag, Silent Film Speaks, have more or less daily for the last few months been tweeting about films from that year only, fascinated as I've been by this 100-year marker and the start of what came to be known as the Roaring Twenties, thereby reflecting on the sobering situation we found ourselves in in these new Twenties, which many a silent film fan, myself included, at the very start of the year were celebrating as a possible return before, of course, world events overtook us. The, Bf the BFI itself had marked poignant centenaries in film in recent years, from 1914 to 1918, as we traced the progress a hundred years hence of that terrible Great War. And we at the Kennington Bioscope had also acknowledged and honoured the centennial anniversary of the first Armistice Day with silent guns, our one-day event in November 2018. So moving on from that place to mark the advent of films from the 1920s is an enticing prospect. 
And although little technical or artistic innovation can be found in Hobson's choice, being largely studio bound and shot in a straightforward fashion, it is a survivor, unlike many of the films I've been tweeting about over the last few months. And it certainly qualifies for some modern qualities according to the criteria set by Bryony in her sight and sound piece on 1920. As she so rightly states, comedy was a fine tool for mocking both outdated social attitudes and the over-optimistic trappings of modernity and 1920 saw some fabulous examples. In Hobson, the pertinent modern question clearly playing on author Brighouse's mind emanating from the middle of the Great War regarding women's self-determination and emergence from under an exploitative paternalistic cosh is seen here through the lens of the late Victorians, but is being shown to its audience as most definitely outdated. This British survivor had been stashed away safely for many years in the National Archive, and although David Lean's version is very well known, this first British production had sunk out of all cine consciousness until our own Tony Fletcher, famed for his dogged dedication in viewing just about every silent film in the BFI archive at least once, if not twice or more, who's been regularly taking up residence in the basement viewing booths at the Stephen Street HQ for years, to such an extent that one wonders if really he should seek sponsorship from a producer of vitamin D supplements for his efforts, dug up Hobson's choice, seemingly unseen since its release. So Tony says, brushing it off for its 21st century premiere on 35mm at a special one-day British silent film festival in April 2013, accompanied by Neil Brand. And a very memorable day it was, held on that occasion at the Cinema Museum in London, which later the same year became the home of that new venture, the Kennington Bioscope, conceived by Cyrus Gabrish, our innovative online producer and accompanist for tonight. So here now is Cyrus with Hobson's Choice.
Thank you so much, Cyrus. That was wonderful. I'm sure that all of you lads and lasses watching at home feel that you made the right and only choice tuning in with us for KBTV in tandem with the BFI tonight. As Janet Moat states in her BFI screen online notes for the 1953 version, the title is a pun. Hobson's choice is no choice at all, precisely the situation Henry Hobson finds himself in by the end of the play. In fact, the themes of Brighouse's Hobson are so universal, like a Grimm's fairy tale set in the North with its three motherless daughters and the arrival of a character acting as a sort of fairy godmother and its male figurehead, a kind of King Lear, if you will, rendering the tale with shades of Shakespeare that yet another stage revival just last year, adapted by Tanika Gupta and directed by Atri Banerjee for Manchester's Royal Exchange Theatre, saw the play finding a fertile new home amid a 1980s setting in the Ugandan Asian rag trade, a production garnering four and five star reviews. So it seems to me that Hobson's choice with its small town bootmaker story definitely has long since proven it has legs and is set to simply run and run and will keep on living timelessly with such revivals. But it's important that we looked back to this, the first screen adaptation brought to life for us on its centenary by the talents and variety of Cyrus Gabrish, who himself was revisiting the film as he'd accompanied, accompanied it live twice before in community outreach screenings in the environs of Leicester on the film's rediscovery back in 2013. We've been running these regular broadcasts for the last 14 weeks during the lockdown period and now continuing on as that situation eases somewhat, all in lieu of our regular live in-person shows which are held at the Cinema Museum in London temporarily closed due to the COVID crisis. Just a reminder though, that they can still do with your help while they lay dormant, waiting to awaken. So please go to their website or Twitter page and sign their petition to support them and give a donation if you can. Even though we very much miss our home venue, we've been over the moon to be in a position to carry on bringing you silent films with top notch accompaniment over these last three months. And the response has been extremely gratifying. So thank you for all your feedback and thoughtful reviews, which are greatly appreciated. We're delighted that subscriber numbers for our YouTube channel have now reached well over 500, which is quite a tidy figure in that time. So thank you to everyone who has subscribed. Remember, it costs nothing to do so. So please keep on subscribing. Remember, you can catch up on previous shows and watch the parts you particularly like over and over again. You'll also be able to re-watch tonight's live stream and catch up on all the chat box activity, which was administrated by Todd Higginson, who also prepared the film for tonight's transmission, for all of which we thank him. And of course, we'd very much appreciate it if you wish to find your way to leave us a donation via our Kennington Bioscope coffee page to support our online efforts and contribute towards future programming which you can do either anonymously or coupled with your comments about the show, all of which we appreciate very much. You can find the link to that here in the drop box below or on our Twitter header. And of course, please don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Ken Bioscope and on Instagram at Kennington Bioscope and to sign up for email updates on upcoming broadcasts via our website, kenningtonbioscope.com. Our deepest thanks again go to the BFI for granting permission for us to screen Hobson's Choice. Thank you to Tony Fletcher for his tireless work in resurrecting forgotten films such as this and many more besides. Thank you to the Cinema Museum and its volunteers and particularly David Lavelli and Phil Clark for their invaluable assistance. Thank you to John Sweeney and Todd Higginson for all their not inconsiderable input towards these live shows. And a very special thank you to our KB TV live producer, mastermind and musical maestro combined, Mr. Cyrus Gabrish. Thank you very much from me, Michelle Facey, and thanks to all of you for opening yourselves to the Kennington Bioscope tonight. And we hope to see you all again very soon. Take good care, stay safe, and cheerio for now.
Bye.